Medical Kidnap Show on KFNX Phoenix Talk Radio with Rick Wood and Brian Shilhavi. Welcome to the Medical Kidnap Show. I'm your host, Rick Wood. And I'm Brian Shilhavi, the producer of the Medical Kidnap Show. And I'm also the editor of MedicalKidnap.com, which is part of the Health Impact News Network. Brian and I are thrilled to be broadcasting our initial show in the city of Phoenix on KFNX Independent Talk Radio 1100. Join us every Thursday night at 9 p.m. a local Phoenix time to listen to the Medical Kidnap Show. Or you can listen online at 1100kfnx.com. We also will stream on our Medical Kidnap Facebook page. And we're working on getting a podcast and YouTube video uh, showing and broadcasting uh, each episode as we go. So as we begin today, Brian, what exactly is medical kidnapping? And correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't you the first one to use the term medical kidnapping? Yeah, Rick, I I think I was. Uh, I started. I first used the term medical kidnapping back in 2014 when uh, we were covering the Peltier case out of Boston Children's Hospital, which had gained a lot of national attention. I mean, that case was covered on a lot of the national shows like Dr. Phil and Huckabee and Glenn Beck. And I'm pretty sure that was the first time I used that term. And of course, it's really caught on now. So... Medical kidnapping is defined as the state coming in and taking children away from their parents and then putting them into state custody and the foster care system. Um, And they do this because the parents don't agree with the doctor regarding maybe a prescribed medical treatment for the family. Sometimes it's as simple as consulting with your doctor about your child's care and you don't like the doctor and you're like, okay, um, we'd like to get a second opinion. Now, doctors are mandated reporters, but often what we have found in the stories that we have covered over the years, and and we've been covering these stories on medicalkidnap.com for about five years now, what we have found is that doctors don't like it when you don't take their advice. And even if you say, I'm going to go to the hospital across town, they will report you. And we've covered stories like that. And so they lose custody of their child and are not even allowed to leave the hospital or be discharged from the hospital, even if they say they're going to another hospital to get a second opinion. So you can't even get a second opinion. That's just crazy. It is. It is crazy. And it's, it happens a lot more times than you think. And we've documented it over the years. Now, we kind of see medical kidnapping as part of a larger problem that we might call state-sponsored child kidnapping, because it's not always a medical component, although most of the time there is going to be a medical component. Um, But in general, state-sponsored kidnapping is where the state steps in and they decide that they know what's best for a child or a group of children within a family, and they remove that child or children without even any formal charges being brought against the parents in a court of law. Now, some of the, some of the examples of stories we've covered over the years are things like you homeschool your children and your neighbors don't like you. So they might see your child running on outside barefoot or something. And because they don't see your children going to school every day, like maybe their children are, they report you. And in, I'm pretty sure all 50 states, Child Protective Services, Child Welfare, and we usually refer to that as CPS, Child Protective Services. There are a few different names according to what state you live in, but they all operate about the same way. And they all will take anonymous phone calls as complaints to investigate. And so when this happens, it's a nightmare, as many families, thousands upon thousands of families have testified that to try to get their children back from the time that they are taken away, whether it's at the hospital or they come into your home with law enforcement, they remove the children, then you are caught up in this massive system and you have to spend a lot of resources. You have to this fight. Is, 
Go ahead. This is without this is without due process or warrants often, I mean as well. That's what's just crazy to me. Is like we seem to like forfeit our rights when it comes to our children. It is how is that even possible? It's possible because the overriding philosophy in these situations is that it's better to protect the child and worry about the consequences later, even if you're acting uh, too quickly. In other words, they would rather err, in their mind view, mind's view, they would rather err on the side of caution. But what has been shown over the years is that this causes traumatic harm with the child, with the family. And again, we're defining medical kidnapping as a child is removed from the home or from the parents, because sometimes it's not in the home, it's in the hospital. It happens with newborn babies. And it happens where the parents don't want it and are not requesting it, obviously, and the children don't want it either. But somebody, a medical professional or a caseworker or a social worker with Child Protective Services has made that determination that that child at that point needs to be removed from the home. Wow. That's just, I, you know, as a homeschool parent myself, uh, you know, it's just, you feel very, uh, it feels very precarious. You know, it feels like, you know, we're not safe. So, you know, how widespread is medical kidnapping? You know, I, 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 do I need to be worried, you know? Medical kidnapping is a problem, Rick, in all 50 states. As I said earlier, we've been covering this issue for five years. And I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell the people, this is a systemic problem. When we first started covering some of the larger national stories that came to our attention, like the Justina Peltier case in Boston Children's Hospital, uh, like the case that happened in 2013 in Sacramento with baby Sammy, uh, there was another case in Detroit with uh, a mother there. These were ones that got into the media, and we thought, wow, these are horrible stories, horrible stories, but they're the exception. But as we began to publish these stories, stories that we had not broken, in other words, we didn't discover these stories. They were in local media, or in, in, in some of these cases that I've just mentioned, national media, and we were just covering them on the Health Impact News Network, and people were outraged. But what we discovered was When we started covering some of the stories ourselves, then we were deluged. We were just overwhelmed with the people who were coming to us and telling us their stories. Now, nationwide, there are about there are over four hundred thousand children in the foster care system right now. Wow, that's incredible. And it is. And while the public is led to believe that these children are mostly from abused homes or orphans, the statistics prove otherwise. Now, depending on the state, because it does vary by state, but based on the government statistics, we're not just pulling these statistics out of the air, but based on government statistics and published reports, 75 to 90 percent of all children who are taken out of their homes are done so for reasons other than abuse. And it comes under this more broad term of neglect. Now, that neglect can be something, as I mentioned earlier, like just simply wanting a second opinion from a different doctor on the medical care for your child. And all of a sudden, bam, you're charged with medical neglect. Wow. There have been stories even in the news recently here um, showing that Child Protective Services is actually used as a weapon against these parents to try to coerce them into certain behaviors. Um, For example, we did a story last year about a mother who um, shared a letter from her dentist on, on social media. It was on Facebook, I believe. And this letter that she published was threatening to report her to CPS for not bringing her children into the dentist office every six months. In other words, if you weren't going to make your appointment, you were going to be reported to CPS. Wow, that is crazy. Just a few weeks ago, there was a story that came out of Philadelphia that made it into the the local media, and I think even into the national media, that caused quite a commotion because parents were showing letters that they had gotten from their child's school uh, threatening them 
and saying that if they didn't pay their back fees for their their children's school lunches, that they were going to be reported to CPS. We're not talking yeah, about. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, we're not talking about abuse at this point. We're talking about other issues where government officials, whether it's a, a public school government official or a social worker with CPS, whatever, they are using the threat of child protective services to be re, to report that parent and have the threat of maybe them coming in and removing your child for whatever reason, reasons other than abuse. Just recently, uh, most of the kids around the country have just gone back to school within the past couple of weeks. And another story that just came out that was in the local media, uh, one school district sent par- uh, letters home with students to their parents, and it said, basically, look, if you don't show up on time after school to pick up your children, we are going to report you to CPS. And another thing, Rick, there was a, a, a story just covered by the Chicago Tribune here within the last week or so. And what they're reporting is that uh, a group of parents are now suing doctors, hospitals, and DCFS, which is Illinois' version of CPS, because they refused the vitamin K shot at birth. We're not even talking about a vaccine at this point. The whole vaccine issue is a loaded issue, and we can deal with that on, on you know, future shows, but we're talking about a vitamin shot. These parents are saying in their lawsuit that they didn't want the vitamin K shot, and as a result, they were separated from their, from their newborn baby now, in most of these cases, they eventually did get the baby back fairly quickly. Uh, we've got many stories where it could take months and months to get the baby back, and you lose that critical bond between a mother and a newborn child. But again, this is not for abuse. Listen to what they report that the parents' rationale was. Uh, they talk about an Angela Bauer And uh, the Bauer said that they are not anti-vaxxers or against any procedure that they believe to be medically necessary, but they didn't think that the shot, the vitamin K shot, was in that category. They had agreed to sign a waiver confirming their wishes that the new baby, their fifth child, not receive vitamin K based on their beliefs that God's creation isn't automatically deficient or flawed at birth. And they took the baby away for like 12 hours to investigate them. It, it, the article goes on to say, James Holder III, son of a former chief judge at the federal courthouse in Chicago, and his wife Courtney are, are lead plaintiffs in the lawsuit. The Holdermans contend that they were subject to a DCFS investigation in May 2018 because they declined the vitamin K shot and other optional procedures of blood screening and eye ointment after the birth of their second child at this particular hospital. This isn't abuse. These parents are not guilty of abuse. We, the public has this image that all these kids are in foster care because they're in danger of being abused. So we're talking about, as I said earlier, anywhere from, depending on the state, 75 to 90% of these children who are in foster care are there not because they were in danger of their parents abusing them, but for other reasons that come under this broader concept of neglect. Some of it seems like bullying to me, too, because I remember when we had one of our kids, and you know, I have three of them, and uh, by the third one, you, you see all the stuff they do, and the eye ointment. I didn't want them to have the eye ointment, and the nurse was like bullying me. I'm like, I know my wife doesn't have gonorrhea. We're okay, you know? And I think some of it, to me, it comes down to that. It's like, you know, if you push back at all, it's like a power trip. Exactly. And what, <laughs> obviously, the trend in this country is going towards is, hey, let's not have babies in hospitals anymore. I mean, throughout history, having a baby was not a medical event after all. Man, that, that's, that's just crazy to me. I think, we, I, think I read one of our stories uh, in Medical Kidnap about the family who 
the child had a fever and they called their doctor and they said, the doctor said, take her to the ER. But before they could even get him in the car, the fever broke in the, and uh, it reduced. And so they didn't feel concerned anymore and it was under control. And the next thing you know, the police were knocking on the door, uh, trying to take the child away. And that was a big mess. I mean, like, it's like, where are, you know, it's like we have no control as parents. Yeah, Rick, you're referring to that case in Chandler, Arizona, that was so horrible that uh, even the local media picked it up. The parents and the children were sleeping in bed. They had brought the kids home. There was no more fever, allegedly. And, um, you know, the, the reportedly, they got a phone call. And the police wanted to come and investigate and make sure everything was fine. But uh, according to the news reports, this is not a story we did. We're just picking up this information because it was covered so much in the local media there. Um, but reportedly, they told them, no, we're, we're already in bed. We don't need any help. But the police came anyway. Uh, the kids were sick and were all sleeping together with the parents and were according to the parents, allegedly fine, but the police used SWAT-like tactics and actually broke down the door, went in, and took the children out by force. Now, the entire thing at the door with these SWAT, this SWAT team, basically, like a military team, was all caught on the family security cameras. And that's probably why it was picked up by local media. I mean, this image of a police SWAT team busting down the door to remove children from a family just because it was reported that one of the kids had a fever and they didn't go to the emergency room. I mean, even the local media had to cover that. That is insane. Yeah, that went viral. That got a lot of national attention. And so, yeah, let, let's talk about Arizona and why we decided to do our first talk show based out of Phoenix. The first medical kidna kidnapping story that, that we covered, in other words, we didn't pick this up from other media sources. This came to us, and we brought this story to the attention of the public, was a story out of Arizona. This is the Mel Melissa Deagle story, and we reported how she lost custody of her two daughters because she disagreed with the doctor and the way the doctors were treating her to medically fragile children who had very, very special needs. She was accused of medical abuse. She was labeled as being uh, psychiatrically not capable of taking care of her children. And, you know, the main reason we were able to cover this story is because the mother, Melissa, was so meticulous in keeping records, all the records, the medical reports, everything. She had everything documented. And she had published all of this material online. And when they took her to court to remove her parental rights, the judge ordered her to take everything down offline. They didn't want the public to know about this. They even ordered me they ordered the editor they ordered health impact news to remove our stories about her can they well, do that <laughs> well yeah no no yeah. not legally yeah. they can't and so since we we know a little bit about the first amendment and we depend upon the first amendment of the constitution which protects freedom of the press freedom of speech we refuse to take down those that story and this began, Rick, a long process of covering many stories out of Arizona. And we have been told numerous times through the courts, through, the, through judges, mostly trying to intimidate the parents to tell us to take down our stories. And we have never once, we have never once removed a story. And we've never been prosecuted because we're the ones that are actually obeying the law. We are practicing our First Amendment constitutional right to bring this to the attention of the public. Now, amazingly, Melissa Deagle's story still continues today, five years later. That, yeah, that's, that's insane to me. I just can't believe it. 
and we're going to cover this in yeah. a future show. We're not going to cover it today. It's an ongoing situation, but we are going to cover it. But her story unleashed a tidal wave in Arizona. We had so many people contacting us every day with similar stories. And this was the genesis of medicalkidnap.com. We were just amazed. We were, it was like being in a daze. It was like, is this really the United States of America? Does, do things like this really happen? It was unbelievable. And here we are five years later, and these stories are still going on, in, not just in Arizona, but all across the United States. But we began to investigate Arizona. And what we found was that in the state of Arizona, they removed children from their homes at a higher rate than any other state in the United States. Wow. Why is that, Arizona? Are the parents in Arizona that much worse than parents in other states that it justifies this mass removal of children from their homes into state-sponsored care and foster care, which unleashes federal funds and this tremendous funding that comes in to the state of Arizona? Are the parents really that much worse in Arizona? Hello, Phoenix. This is why we're here. This is why we're on KFNX broadcasting directly to you because you're probably not going to hear this in your local media much. That's why I'm glad we found KFNX, Brian. Uh, Speaking of that, we have to take a quick break. We'll be right back and continue our discussion about Arizona and state-sponsored child kidnapping. You're listening to the Medical Kidnap Show on KFNX Independent Talk Radio 1100.
we're back. I'm Rick Wood, the host of the Medical Kidnap Show, and with me is Brian Shalhabi, the producer of the show and the editor of MedicalKidnap.com. We're talking about how Arizona removes children from their homes at a higher rate than any other state in the United States. Brian? So what's going on in Arizona? Are the parents really that bad? Or is there something more sinister going on in Arizona? Now, let me tell you, one of the most horrific stories that we have ever published on medicalkidnap.com happened in 2017 in the military town of Sierra Vista near Tucson, Arizona. Now, I need to warn our listeners right now, this is not a story suitable for young ears. It is that bad. It is that horrible. So if you have sensitive ears, if you have young children, this is not a story to listen to. This story was very briefly covered in the local media, but not much. What happened in 2017 is that federal agents arrested David Frodsham, a deputy commander of the Army base there, and also a licensed foster parent with the state of Arizona. And he was arrested for running a child pornographic ring out of his home and for child sex trafficking. This man was actually, according to the lawsuit, kicked out of Afghanistan for deviant sexual behavior. So he comes back to the army base in Arizona and he gets licensed as a foster care parent. And when you dig into this story, it is horrific. And it's not like people didn't warn the state what was going on with this guy. He had run-ins with the law. He was reportedly picked up drunk when he was picking up his check for being a foster parent. There were kids in the car at the time, but he continued on as a foster parent. And today he sits in prison. Thankfully, he's in prison. How many children had to suffer because of the misuse, uh, the abuse of the system? It's insane to me. And what, what is so bad about this particular story is that after David Frodsham was arrested, and then later convicted. This little girl who was found in his home, and this was a little girl who was taken away from her mother just before her two-year-old birthday. And according to the lawsuit, this little girl was repeatedly raped in David Frodsham's home, his foster home. And when he was arrested, Do you think the state gave her back to her mother? No. She was put into another foster home. My gosh, that's so bad. With a woman, and I might not be pronouncing her name right here, but with a woman by the name of Samantha uh, Osteras. And today, Samantha Osteras is sitting in prison too, because what ended up happening is that she scalded this little girl, Devaney, so bad in a bathtub that 80% of her body was burned and she lost all of her toes. That is absolutely horrific. This is the foster care system that is operating in the state of Arizona. Wake up, people. Why did it take federal agents to arrest these people, to arrest David Frodsham at least? This wasn't local law enforcement in Arizona. Federal agents had to come in. Probably following the trail from Afghanistan, and I won't get into all of that right now. But this is the state of the foster care system and the child protective system in Arizona today. It is a state that has a history of problems with child welfare. The former governor, Jan Brewer, abolished the entire system and and put it into a different department. But people who follow the story will tell you Things didn't get better. They only got worse. I mean, taking a child away, uh, I guarantee you what she was taken away from her mother for was far less serious than what she ended up suffering. And it's just, 
it seems unfair, you know, so I'm glad uh, that we are in Arizona, that we are in Phoenix, to give voice to the voiceless, to, to let people know uh, what's happening in their city and their state so that they can, you know, be aware, they can make noise, they can uh, make their voices heard as well and also protect themselves. Yes. And if you want to read the entire story of little Devaney, you go to medicalkidnap.com. Because even when the media does report on some of these stories that are bad, I mean, it's, it's bad when somebody gets arrested and convicted and goes to prison, right? You got to cover that. Local media has to cover that. But I'll tell you what they almost never cover. They almost never go back to the parent who had that child taken away. And we did. We did. I had a reporter working with me who was is one of the co-founders of Medical Kinetic to Come, uh, Terry LaPointe, and she tracked down the mother and she interviewed her and we did her story and she didn't do anything that deserved having her daughter taken away from her. Nothing. And you can read it all on medicalkidnap.com. Well, Brian, we're also very fortunate to have somebody from the state of Arizona with us who's lived there since the 1950s, uh, Steve Isham, uh, who has uh, studied and been and served the state of, uh, of Arizona for over 40 years. Steve has a MA in special education and an LBSW in social work degree. Um, he's educated, advocated, and he's fought for children and families since 1975. Um, his experience spans education, special education, uh, school administration, behavioral health, juvenile justice, developmental disabilities, curriculum development, coaching. He's also the author of a book on child and family advocacy, and he's served others throughout his career. Steve, you have not been very busy at all in those 40 plus years, but welcome to the Medical Kidnap Show. We're glad to have you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on uh, on the new show, and I hope it's a good success. Uh, communication like this is truly needed, especially in Arizona. And Steve, you are our very first guest on the Medical Kidnap Show, and we are honored that you would take the time to spend a little bit of time with us on our inaugural show here in Phoenix. Thank you so much. I appreciate it being here. All right, Steve. So let's dive in. Um, I know that you've written quite a bit about uh, the financial aspect that is tied to uh, what we're talking about, medical kidnapping, but not just even medical kidnapping, just the entire um, child advocacy, the child protection system. Can you just tell us a little bit about the financial link to uh, child protection, child advocacy, not just in the state of Arizona, but in the, in, in, you know, in the United States overall? Well, in, way back in 1974, there was the Mondale Act. And that opened the door to start getting funding or incentives to help these children uh, in difficult situations. It got twisted uh, years later. Uh, it really took off when Janet Napolitano was the uh, governor of the state of Arizona. She made a uh, decision that uh, we would go ahead and take children if there was anything at all that they could get their. Uh, uh, get their mind around, uh, they would take the child and then they would let the courts set it out, settle it out later. Uh, they don't use warrants. Uh, they can tie, take a child for just about anything. Uh, it doesn't have to be any evidence or any proof that anything has happened. Uh, they take the child. The financial uh, windfall for this is is just incredible. If they spent that amount of money helping the kids stay in their homes, uh, have parent training, do all kinds of other things, it would be so much better. But again, they wouldn't get any money for that. The incentive uh, has grown and it's been built into the budgets in states. And so they really can't step out of this. We're talking about billions of dollars. Uh, Arizona, you know, you're looking at probably 1.5 billion if you put every single thing, all the different streams of money that come in. Uh, it's yeah, it's almost like an addict. You can't you can't stop because you're taking so much of the 
the drug, and that's what this money's become for states nationwide. It's, uh, you know, it's their fix. They got to have this $1.5 billion. Uh, and I'm talking about not just federal money, but uh, research money from genetic and uh, the developmental disability uh, entities, hospitals, doctors. Uh, it's, it's a huge part of every state's uh, state budget and the economy for that state. I did read an article where uh, talking about that, where hospitals have a financial incentive to, um, you know, because of research money and things like that. So when you say 1.5 billion in the state of Arizona, that's yearly we're talking about. That's the, how much income is at risk. Is that correct? Correct. Wow. That's incredible. And Steve, do you think that this massive funding that you've just talked about has a direct correlation to, to the statistics that Arizona takes the highest percentage of children away from their parents of any other state in the country? Do you think that's linked into this? Does that link into this funding? Does it unleash it somehow? Are there quotas, for example? Do they have to take so many children to be able to obtain this funding? Well, and so, see, and that's one of the, the odd things about this money. If you take a little bit of more kids this year than you did last year, you get an increase of your money that you're allowed uh, from the feds. Uh, so there's absolutely no incentive for any state to return kids to the parents. It's a, the financial incentives are all about taking those kids, adopting those kids out. Uh, it, it's horrendous. And parents here, uh, are, it's, they're pretty much like everywhere in the nation. Uh, you know, I don't believe our parents abuse children any more than any other state. Well, Steve, I mean, you and I, we've worked together really since the inception of medicalkidnap.com when we started publishing these stories. And you've been a wealth of information, you know, being pretty much a, a lifelong resident of the state and a, an advocate for children and families. And one of the things that we've discussed, you and I and several of the families, is this um, position in the Senate, right? This Maria Hoffman, who's labeled as a family advocate, <clears throat> excuse me, I think her official title is Director of Arizona Legislative Office of Family Advocacy. and. We've written a couple articles about her. Uh, this uh, Maria Hoffman, she's not an elected official, but she's a contractor. She has a contract with the state of Arizona. She reports directly to the president of the Senate. Um, I've been told that when a new uh, uh, session of the legislature is put in place after an election, that she addresses either the House or the Senate, and she tells these newly elected um, government officials that they're not supposed to deal with any of their constituents' concerns about CPS issues, about children being removed from their home and, and going through the child welfare system once they get into state custody, but that every single uh, Arizona senator and House member is supposed to only go through her. And so we've tried to figure out, who is this woman? Well, we contacted a former legislator who worked, you know, who was an elected official in the Arizona House. And she, this person wanted to remain anonymous, but this is what the person said. As a representative of elected officials, she is standing in the way of accountability with elected officials and agencies. Hoffman threatens that Christie, the one who wrote the original email, and others who question her and the system are breaking state law and can be held in contempt without backing it up by citing the law. Where is that law? She is intimidating people with threats of contempt, but we don't need a lesson in government. We know how it works. Where is the accountability of Hoffman? She is part of what appears to be a cover-up. She is acting as a barrier to truth and transparency. The system seems to be hiding something, but Hoffman is hindering those trying to learn what it is. Is the agency being held accountable? Parents can't fight for themselves in this kangaroo court. 
checks and balances are needed, and that is the job of the legislative branch. The judges aren't elected. So this was a, a former legislator who was very frustrated. This person could not represent her constituencies, uh, the people in her, her, her division that she represented, because everything had to go through Maria Hoffman. So Steve, what, what can you tell us? What, what, in your experience, what can you tell us about this Maria Hoffman that is on the public payroll? She's being funded by taxpayer dollars in the state of Arizona, a state that takes the highest percentage of children away from their parents. State legislators are told, don't deal with these child advocacy issues with your constituents. You come to me. If anybody asks, she threatens them. She says, you're violating a law. This is a court matter, and you have no business knowing it. Um, who is this Maria Hoffman, Steve? She's a very well-connected lady. Uh, I've known her for a very long time. Uh, the first time I ever met uh, Maria Hoffman was uh, she and another young lady were Playboy bunnies. and they came to uh, Lake Pleasant where there were boat races to hand out the awards. And so that's where I first uh, met her. Years, and what year was this? Uh, it would have been Sunday, April 28, 1968. Wow, you know the exact date. Okay. Well, I have the bro. I still have all of the, the brochures from the races uh, and the, for the club that my dad and uh, some other men started called the Arizona Navy. And they eventually had these races at Lake Pleasant, and then they uh, opened a man-made lake uh, on the way to Tucson. Uh, and so that's where I first met her. So, Steve, uh, in 1968, I don't know the history that well here, but this would have been very close to the beginning of Hugh Hefner's Playboy Clubs, right? This, I'm, I'm thinking, was probably very, very shortly after establishing a Playboy Club in the Phoenix, Arizona area. Is that, am I right on that? You know, you may very well be. I was only 15. I was in high school. Okay. And I was working uh, the, the grandstand and running the time clock with my dad. So. Okay. Well, I mean, we don't want to make a big deal out of this. But again, this Maria Hoffman, she doesn't, you know, explain herself. She doesn't give interviews, apparently, to the press. And she controls the lives of a lot of children who are taken away from their parents. And we just feel like because she is supported by taxpayer dollars, people should know about her past, how these very influential women helped her start a shelter, which led to government appointments. And if we go back far enough, she got her career started as a Playboy bunny. And that doesn't seem like something that would qualify you to be an advocate for child safety or child welfare, would it? So we just wanted to bring this out to the public because it's very unlikely that this will be covered in the local media there in Arizona. No, they wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Uh, it's a very secret position. Uh, for years, I didn't even know it existed. And then as parents uh, found out from other parents and some of my students, uh, Holly, I did. I taught 20 years at the University of Phoenix and then 17 at South Mountain Community College and 14 at Glendale Community College. So I had a lot of students in those years. Uh, and so they hear about my advocacy and stuff, and then they give my name to other people. Well, some of these moms started bringing up Maria Hoffman's name. And I knew Maria in other uh, venues because uh, I ran a, a children's statewide nonprofit. I was the executive director fund development, those type of things. And so I knew her because she was in charge of most of the, not in charge, but she was the head of this organization that presented uh, the different provider agencies. Okay. Uh, it's all, you can't, there's no, it's not put out to bid. It's not an open bid or a way to get to this position. Uh, in the state of Arizona, you have to go over 50000 So her contract is $49,000 a year. Uh, and so I've heard all kinds and even seen the emails that shared that, that she sent to parents that have sent them on to me. Uh, you know, I've gotten letters from staff at the Senate 
telling me to be careful, watch out. You know, uh, they're asking too many questions about the position. Uh, wow. It's, yeah. Uh, I, you and know, this, legislators, and- some of the legislators, there's a couple, one of them played football with my son at Tolson High School. And uh, he's a state legislator. Well, I went to him. My wife and I went to visit with him. And he just said, he just said, I, I can't touch him, Steve. They, you know, we're warned by the, by the AG. Uh, and uh, everything has to go through Maria Hoffman. So anything we get, we just automatically do it. Uh, and I've talked with other legislators off the record. And they know you, you just don't buck the system. You don't you don't bring this stuff up because uh, that's the way the state wants it. We have about thirteen thousand now, so you can imagine if there's thirteen thousand kids in foster care in this state, that means there's twenty six thousand parents uh, that don't have their children. So out of out of that you know that number, you know she blocks all of this. Nobody can get to their legislators. The legislators are scared. I helped uh, one of the legislators in the Senate a couple of years ago because uh, she was the head of the Senate and she had the guts to uh, try to address this. I helped her staff write a bill. It went to the legislature uh, and the governor called her. And I was in her office when the, she took the call and told her, if you want to waste your one bill, on this, go ahead, because I'm going to veto it. So you might as well not even bring it, you know. So, but if you want some other bill, you know, let me know. So she just shut it down immediately, and that was the end of it. Uh, unelected position has this much power. That's what's interesting to me. Uh, Welcome it, to Arizona politics, and I can tell you, we're going to cover more of this in future shows, because obviously, there is a reason why this happens in Arizona. There is a reason why Arizona has the highest percentage of children taken away from their parents than any other state in the U.S. There is a reason. And I think most people would agree it's not because the parents in Arizona are worse at parenting and deserve to have their children taken away more so than other states around the country. So this is a topic for future shows. Steve, thank you so much for being with us. We, we really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll have you on again and keep up the great work, man. All right, you guys too. All right, God bless. Bless you guys too. Thanks for listening to our first broadcast of the Medical Kidnap Show. See you next week at the same time on KFNX 1100 Independent Talk Radio. Or you can check us out on the web at medicalkidnap.com.